Welcome to NTD Evening News. Our top story tonight, paying tribute to history while including a warning for today. President Biden invokes current issues and themes as he commemorates D-Day in Normandy. Iris Tao brings us more from Normandy, France. The prosecution in the Hunter Biden criminal trial is wrapping up its case, but have they proven the younger Biden lied on the gun registration form? Arlene Richards has the latest from today's testimony. Former President Trump is reportedly closer to picking a running mate for this year's election. Arian Pazdar brings us the list with the names of possible candidates. Israeli airstrikes hit a school in the Gaza Strip. Israel says it was used as a terrorist hideout, while others say there were no gunmen there at all. Jason Perry reports. And much of California and the Southwest are enduring extreme heat today as a weather system brings scorching temperatures to the region. Christina Corona in Los Angeles. This is NTD Evening News. Live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City, here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. Speaking in Normandy, President Biden outlined lessons from World War II to warn against bowing to dictators and isolating the U.S. in today's world. NTD's Iris Tao has more from today's D-Day commemoration in Normandy, France. Right here near the beaches of Normandy, President Biden hails the fight for freedom as he commemorates the 80th anniversary of the D-Day invasion, which turned a tide in World War II. The battle between freedom and tyranny, the Allied forces of D-Day did their duty. Now the question for us is, in our hour of trial, will we do ours? Biden gave a speech this morning at the Normandy American Cemetery, which is technically American soil, as the French gifted the land to the U.S. after the war. More than 70,000 U.S. troops joined Allied forces for the daring D-Day operation, which, despite heavy casualties, marked the largest seaborne invasion in human history and paved the way for the Nazis' defeat in Europe. President Biden meeting with surviving veterans who fought in Normandy, most into the late 90s and some over 100. This could be the last major commemoration in which these veterans are alive to bear witness. Let us be worthy of their sacrifice. Biden also invoked common themes in his 2024 pitch, among which defending democracy. We defend democracy. We stand together. Bolstering NATO. Isolationism was not the answer 80 years ago and is not the answer today. And supporting Ukraine. We will not walk away. And on Friday, Biden will give another speech in Normandy, this time focused on freedom and democracy and targeting audiences at home in the U.S. In that speech, he's expected to contrast himself with his 2024 rival, former President Trump, and highlight the, quote, dangers of isolationism. And Biden over the weekend is also expected to meet with French President Emmanuel Macron in his first state visit to France as president. It all comes as revitalizing alliances remains a top agenda in Biden's 2024 campaign. Reporting from Normandy, France, Iris Tao, NTD News. Federal prosecutors called some of their last witnesses today in the Hunter Biden criminal trial. The first son is accused of illegally buying a handgun while addicted to drugs. A key witness for the prosecution, Hallie Biden, testified that she witnessed Hunter Biden looking high when she saw him in the month that he possessed the gun. Our legal correspondent, Arlene Richards, has more. A crucial witness may be the prosecution's only hope for convincing the jury that Hunter Biden was actively using drugs when he bought a gun. Hunter's sister-in-law, Hallie Biden, who he was romantically involved with, is the only witness who spent time with Biden between October 6 to 22, 2018. Her testimony Thursday was key in linking Hunter's drug use with the day he purchased the gun and for the days he possessed it afterwards. Prosecutors must prove that the president's son knowingly lied on a gun registration form about his addiction and use of illegal drugs. President Biden told ABC in an interview Thursday that he would not pardon his son if he is convicted, echoing a response from the White House late last year. From a presidential perspective, is there any possibility that the president would end up pardoning his son? No. 
I just said no. I just answered. Howley testified that she found the gun in the younger Biden's truck and put it in a leather pouch along with the ammunition, then threw them in a dumpster. She said she also found drugs and drug paraphernalia in the truck and that Hunter appeared to be high when she saw him in October. The defense hammered her on cross-examination to remember the details of what happened after she found the gun. The first son's attorney used phone records and text messages to piece together a timeline. Hallie admitted that she didn't witness Hunter smoking crack or drinking alcohol during the relevant time period, which is helpful for Hunter's defense. But she couldn't recall many of the details after Hunter found out she got rid of the gun. The defense has argued that Hunter was trying to hide from Hallie after he bought the gun and lied to her in text messages about smoking crack. Hallie confirmed that there were times when Hunter wouldn't tell her the truth. Earlier Thursday, Gordon Cleveland returned to the stand for cross-examination. He's the man who sold Hunter Biden the gun in 2018. The defense asked questions about the federal form Hunter filled out to purchase the gun. Cleveland had testified that he watched the younger Biden fill out the form and that he didn't ask for any help. The defense attempted to get testimony about store employees later altering the form, but the judge ruled earlier that it was irrelevant. The prosecution objected several times before Cleveland could answer questions about it. Other prosecution witnesses included Delaware police officers who responded to Halley's report of throwing away the gun. One of them testified that the box of ammunition was missing two bullets. The prosecution is expected to rest its case Friday after calling two more witnesses. And Arlene, none of the key witnesses were able to say they saw Hunter Biden smoking or drinking in the month that he purchased the gun. How does this affect the prosecution's case? Well, the prosecution has shown overwhelming evidence that Biden was addicted, and they have also shown that, you know, he was using, wasn't, they couldn't show that he was using drugs at the time that he signed that form or in the days after he had the gun. So without that evidence, the jury may not convict him. Arlene, thank you for those updates. Thank you. The Israeli military reported striking a United Nations school in the Gaza Strip. The IDF says terrorists were in the school, while others say there were no gunmen at the school at all. NTD's Jason Perry has the details. In a warning, this report contains footage that some viewers may find disturbing. Residents in the central Gaza Strip helped carry bodies to ambulances after Israeli airstrikes hit a school. The school was run by the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA, and it was housing about 6,000 people, according to the agency. However, Israel Defense Forces said a Hamas compound was embedded inside the school. And on Wednesday night, Israel Defense Forces reported using precision targeting to strike the school. The damage to the school appears to correlate with the infographic the IDF released. Based on its intelligence, Israel assessed that there were 20 to 30 terrorists inside the school during the strike. However, a Hamas official said at least 40 people were killed, including women and children. I was wounded at the school. The school does not have anyone who is wanted. There are no armed people in it. I was sitting next to my father. May God have mercy on him. Then suddenly I felt something on my head. Lots of blocks, rubble fell on my legs. Then I fell unconscious. An Israeli government spokesperson also commented on the strike. The compound was used for staging attacks and as a forward operating base. Our strike was based on intelligence and used precise munitions, using surveillance and intelligence. You know, we actually called it off uh, twice just to be sure that we were precise and to limit any unwanted civilian casualties. And meanwhile, the Iran-backed Hezbollah terrorist group in Lebanon launched a drone into northern Israel that injured at least seven people on Wednesday. And the next day, the IDF released video of fighter jets striking several targets, including a weapon storage facility and military sites deep into Lebanese territory. Also in Lebanon, a gunman on Wednesday attacked the U.S. Embassy near Beirut, injuring a security guard. The Lebanese military said the gunman was shot and captured. Jason Perry, 
NTD News. A heat dome traps several states under extreme temperatures, bringing scorching record highs to the southwest. NTD's Christina Corona provides us with the latest weather update. An early season heat dome is bringing life-threatening temperatures to 30 million people this week from Texas to California. On Wednesday, Death Valley, California saw the highest temperature in the U.S., hitting a blistering 118 degrees. Del Rio, Texas and Lancaster, California both reached record highs with temperatures of 107 degrees and 103 degrees. Temperatures were predicted on Thursday to reach 114 degrees in Phoenix, Arizona, 111 degrees in Las Vegas, Nevada, 111 degrees in Palm Springs and 121 degrees in Death Valley, California. Many tourists descended to Death Valley, California to experience the heat wave. Well, I'll tell you, we've never seen a temperature like this before coming from the Northeast, so it feels like um, baking right now. Yeah. Instant pan. Well, this area is known for, for heat, and it was one of the things we wanted to do was get out here and just experience it for real. So, um, but you don't want to be out long, you can tell. And you can't tell that you're, you're sweating. But are these three-digit temperatures unusual? Now, being this warm this early is not necessarily unusual. Um, you know, we've gotten 120s even in late May before. Um, so it's really going to be the, the whole summer. Yeah. Uh, what we've really seen over the last couple of years is not just that the highs maybe are getting a little bit higher, but it's really that the lows aren't cooling down. Um, so we're staying in these really hot temperatures for 24, 48 hour, 72 hour periods sometimes. And how some residents in Central California are trying to beat the heat. You deal with it. Maybe we'll, Bambi and I'll go driving around because the truck at least has air conditioning. You're liable to have 105, 110 degree days in June, July, August is generally the warmest. And I grew up here, so uh, melting on the sidewalk is a yearly event. The heat warnings are expected to run until the end of Friday. The worst of the heat will last through Saturday with record highs possible as far north as Colorado, Idaho and Oregon. Christina Corona, NTD News, Arcadia. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Earlier we spoke with retired Colonel Grant Newsham, a senior fellow at the Center for Security Policy, about the current security challenges facing the U.S. and its allies. Grant Newsham, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. I'm glad to be here. President Biden is in France commemorating the 80th anniversary of D-Day, but he's not only there just for that. He is also there to deepen ties with transatlantic allies like France. This is in the face of looming and ongoing threats from Russia as well as China. Now, to begin, what is the strategic relationship between the U.S. and France? Well, at the end of the day, the Americans and the French are allies and they're friends. Uh, yes, there's been problems over the years and there's problems even now. Uh, there's something about the French that they want to be difficult sometimes. Uh, and the French have a, sort of a slice of their ruling class that hates America, uh, just as America has a slice of its ruling class that hates America too. So it is a contentious relationship sometime. Uh, you saw, for example, them uh, trying to undercut uh, the American efforts in Iraq at the very beginning, and that was serious. But, but overall, it's been a good, it's a good relationship, uh, though it does take a lot of work. And there's a difference between France's ruling class and also the French people. Uh, but as I said, they're an ally. And when we start to feel threatened by the same people, then we start to get along uh, much better. Hmm. Expanding on that, National Security Council spokesman John Kirby is saying that President Biden, quote, really believes we are at an inflection point in history, adding that it's tied to the way geopolitics are changing, the way challenges are being presented to us around the world. Now, how much do you see a role by the Chinese communist regime playing into this? Well, I think the Chinese see themselves as having some momentum now. Uh, they see that regimes like them, the Russians, the Iranians, even the North Koreans, kind of have a, up a head of steam. And they, so they've got this momentum, and they are pushing. You can see that in Ukraine, Gaza, Middle East, uh, the Chinese pushing in their area uh, severely. Anybody who lives in Asia 
uh, knows about the, sort of this Chinese juggernaut that's coming its way. And you're seeing this alignment of interests and alignment of capabilities of uh, these kind of nasty, aggressive regimes. Uh, so this is a challenge for the civilized world. As for this being an inflection point, uh, we probably had a couple inflection points every year for the last 200 years. Uh, so he may be overstating it, but I don't think he's understa overstating the seriousness of the problem. And the Chinese really do have the, the economic clout and the military might uh, to really give this, as I said, this alliance of uh, nasty regimes, uh, really the, the wherewithal and the, the political, the, the psychological support even, uh, to really pose a real threat to the, the free world now. On that note, President Biden is also meeting with Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky today. That says reports warn of a new Russian offensive. Now, how does what happens in Ukraine as well as the Middle East impact a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan? What should we be looking out for here? Well, what you need to look at, look at is how much success are the Russians having? The, the is Hamas the Iranians having in what they're trying to do? And by measuring success, it's not just uh, what they've taken on the battlefield or any success they've had there, but look at the reaction of the United States and the rest of the West. Uh, have they sort of rolled over? Have they backed off? Are they trying desperately to make a deal, uh, a deal that allows an aggressor, really a murderous aggressor, uh, to get away with something? to end up better than they were when they started. And if that's what they're seeing, well, if you see weakness, if you smell confusion and chaos, well, you take advantage of it if you're a certain kind of country, and that's what these uh, regimes are. So really look, as I said, not just at what's going on the f in the battlefield, but what is the reaction of the countries that are their victims? And particularly, what is the reaction of the United States, which is the one nation that so to give some substance to the defense of the free world. Given the tensions and wars we are seeing around the world, how can the U.S. work with allies to counter the Chinese Communist regime's influence on the world stage? Well, somehow you've got to get people to remember Ben Franklin's words that we either hang together or we'll hang separately. Uh, and that is just part of the, the equation. You do have to explain yourself, but at the same time, uh, you've got to make sure that your own military is overwhelmingly superior. Uh, yes, we need allies, but you can't say, well, we're so weak, we have to have you, but rather it should be, we're so strong that you want to be with us and we're going to protect you uh, as well. You do have to speak clearly to people, and even if they're your friends. Uh, for too many years, successive American regimes let the Europeans get away with basically dismantling their defenses. Uh, they said, please don't, and they were laughed at. And then Mr. Trump came along and was serious about it, and they still laughed at him, but they sort of got the message. And now Putin uh, and the Chinese have kind of woken them up uh, a bit. But America needs to take the lead, so there's a military component. At the same time, you have got to consider the economic aspect, the economic component of this fight we have with these regimes. And you've got to do whatever is necessary to get a free world block if necessary, a free world economic block, because uh, you're not going to have any success if uh, the free nations continue to fund and support uh, these regimes like uh, China, Iran, Russia even, and Venezuela, Cuba, you name it. It seems like we talk about uh, having to defend ourselves and at the same time we're funding, doing business with, allowing all sorts of exemptions on sanctions that support and bolster these countries that want to kill us. Now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So the U.S. has to recognize, though, that it is the, the big dog, and it's not leading from behind, and uh, as the Obama administration said, but it is the, the top, top country in this fight. And get our own house in order, our own military, our own finances, our own economy, our own politics, uh, and then you will have other countries that have the confidence to really, really be allies uh, of us and to do what is necessary, but also hold them to account uh, for too long. It was seen that there was really no real downside to telling the Americans, uh, no, we're not going to do it or just ignoring them. Uh, there has to be some downside to that. So it all comes down to leadership. Grant Newsham, thank you so much for your time.
No, thanks for having me. Arizona lawmakers recently approved a measure that would allow voters to decide if local police can arrest illegal immigrants. That says border authorities are starting to deport border crossers after President Biden's executive action. The Republican-controlled Arizona legislature approved a proposal Tuesday that would allow voters to decide whether or not it's a state crime for non-citizens to enter the state through Mexico at any location other than a port of entry. Approved in a 31 to 29 vote by the state house, the measure will now be on the November 5th ballot. The vote came as President Joe Biden unveiled plans Tuesday to restrict the number of illegal immigrants at the U.S.-Mexico border, saying, This action will help us gain control of our border, restore order to the process. This ban will remain in place until the number of people trying to enter illegally is reduced to a level that our system can effectively manage. According to two senior Homeland Security Department officials, the first deportations under the new rule occurred Wednesday. The officials didn't disclose how many were deported and said they expected it would take several days to ramp up. More than anything, we come here for the opportunities. In other countries, we are not wanted as migrants, so they don't allow us to enter like this. At this time, the only country that lets migrants in and lets us work is the United States. Arizona's proposal would allow state and local police to arrest people crossing the border without authorization. It would also give state judges the power to order people convicted of the offense to return to their countries of origin. Opponents called the legislation unconstitutional and said it would lead to racial profiling and create several millions of dollars in additional policing costs that Arizona cities, counties, and state cannot afford. The proposal is similar to a Texas law that has been put on hold by a federal appeals court while it's being challenged. While federal law already prohibits unauthorized border crossing into the U.S., proponents say the federal government has not done enough to stop people from illegally crossing over. They also said some people who enter Arizona without authorization commit identity theft and take advantage of public benefits. The border crisis is impacting not just the southern border, but also the border to the north. Canadian authorities say they have broken up a large-scale human smuggling ring that moved hundreds of immigrants illegally into the United States. Canada's federal police said they arrested four people and issued arrest warrants for four others. The gang allegedly charged immigrants thousands of dollars each before moving them through communities in Canada and then across the border into the U.S. This happened between July 2022 and June 2023. Police said transnational criminal networks are exploiting people who want to make the cross-border journey. Police said some lost their lives during nighttime crossings but gave no details. Two of the people that police have charged come from an indigenous reserve that straddles both sides of the U.S.-Canada border. Local lawmakers are trying to overturn New York City's sanctuary city laws. This comes after a growing number of crimes committed by illegal immigrants. NTD's Fiona G has more. Today in City Hall, the New York City Common Sense Caucus introduced legislation that they hope will help to repeal sanctuary city laws. Leader of the caucus, Council Member Robert Holden, says that the current sanctuary city laws allow criminals to enter the city easily and without detection. Why shield criminals? Why? If they attack 40 people and they have a robbery uh, uh, gang, do we want to keep them so they can victimize more citizens? It's, it's certainly insane to do that. But it's common sense to get rid of these laws. They don't protect immigrants, they protect criminals. As the mayor stated back in February, that he was going to start to open the doors of communication so that we could once again bring ICE and our police together and deport, deport these criminals. Like, I think a city that chooses to be a sanctuary city that votes on that sort of gets to have those policies. Um, and federal enforcement sort of will have to find another way around. Um, I think it's a just a, a positive thing for um, there to be cities that, you know, allow um, immigrants to have refuge. Um, yeah, I think that's important that New York gets to play that role. 
I think that's a good idea. I think they should revoke the sanctuary city laws. And yeah. Why, do you think so? why? Because I, I think we need to have better control over the immigrants coming into our country as well as our cities. I am pro-immigrant, but I do think it has to be an orderly process. Supporters of today's proposed legislation say that sanctuary city laws are actually preventing the NYPD from working together with federal agencies in order to identify and detain criminals entering the country illegally. They cited an incident from earlier this week when two New York police officers were shot by an illegal immigrant from Venezuela. Now, Councilman Holden is emphasizing that today's legislation would target criminals and not immigrants. Fiona G, NTD News. New reports say former President Trump is closer to picking a running mate for this year's election. That says Trump is holding his first major appearance today since his historic conviction last week. NTD's Arian Pazdar has the updates. November 5th is going to be the most important day in the history of our country. Former President Trump gearing up for the presidential election. Trump's campaign has reportedly started requesting information from possible vice presidential candidates. The Associated Press published a list of people on Thursday, which they received from people familiar with the matter. Among those are a number of Republican senators, namely Florida Senator Marco Rubio, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance and South Carolina Senator Tim Scott. Also on the list are North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, Florida Representative Byron Donalds, New York Representative Elise Stefanik and former Trump cabinet member Ben Carson. Different types of paperwork have reportedly been exchanged with each of those people to vet them. A spokesperson for the Trump campaign commented saying anyone claiming to know who or when President Trump will choose his VP is lying unless the person is named Donald J. Trump. But just on Tuesday, Trump mentioned a few of the names on the list while speaking about potential VP picks with Newsmax. Tim Scott didn't run as good a race as he's capable of running for himself. But as a surrogate for me, he's unbelievable. He's been incredible. Uh, Governor Burgum from North Dakota has been incredible. Uh, Marco Rubio has been great. Uh, J.D. Vance has been great. We've had so many great people out there. Ben Carson... And also on Thursday, Trump is attending a town hall meeting in Phoenix, Arizona. It's his first major appearance since the historic conviction on felony charges last week. After that conviction, Trump did speak for half an hour, but didn't take any questions. The only way they think they can win this election is by doing exactly what they're doing right now. Win it in the courts because they can't win it at the ballot box. At Thursday's Arizona event, Trump is scheduled to take questions from a live audience. That's according to Turning Point Action, which is organizing the town hall. Arian Pastar, NTD News. Welcome back. If you're just joining us now, here's some today's top headlines. More prosecution witnesses testified in Hunter Biden's federal gun trial. Bo Bowden's widow Hallie Biden detailed her relationship with Hunter Biden and his drug use around the time of the gun purchase. Israeli forces struck a United Nations school in the Gaza Strip, saying terrorists were in the school. This came while a gunman attacked the U.S. Embassy in Lebanon, injuring a security guard. President Biden delivered a speech on the 80th anniversary of D-Day in Normandy. He paid tribute to veterans, stressed democracy, and drew parallels to the current Russia-Ukraine war. This came as his administration will send another $225 million in military aid to Ukraine. Joining us now to explore the historical significance of D-Day on its 80th anniversary is retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Darren Gobb. He was a Black Hawk helicopter pilot and is the co-founder and executive director of Restore Liberty. Darren, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you. Now, today is the 80th anniversary of D-Day, when Allied forces launched the largest amphibious invasion in military history. Over 4,400 Allied troops were killed that day, including over 2,500 Americans. Bring us back to what happened on June 6, 1944. Yeah, Tiffany, thanks for having me on. Yet, uh, June 6, 1944 was the, the inevitable day that was arrived at due to 
months, in fact, in some ways, years of planning on behalf of the allies who said that this is the day, the time and the location to do this due to the beaches, the weather, and many other circumstances that surround that were a part of building this coalition across um, the United Kingdom and and using their and using their land to uh, to stage them and then moved and then moved across the channel and if you've seen the channel and you've and you've stood on the beaches as I have, you recognize just how big of a feat this was, and how this day defined courage for so many people as they uh, they left the uh, flotilla and moved ashore and up the cliffs and beaches and, uh, the, and, the, and the tough terrain to access around, around those beaches. And ultimately it resulted in the liberation of Europe and the removal of the, uh, the Nazi party and, and those who supported them in Germany. And even the youngest of the brave troops who landed on the Normandy beaches in 1944 are now close to 100 years old. Many say this could be the last round year that will be able to commemorate this event with the veteran generation that actually fought the war. In your view, what is the best way the free world can remember this day and not let it fade into the sands of time? Yes, and I say that uh, that is the greatest generation and it's called that for a reason. And the best thing we can do today is remember their sacrifice they made and why they made it. And oftentimes when you talk to the soldiers, it was about their families, the people next to them that they were supporting. It was in some ways about this grand adventure of going overseas. But uh, from a bigger perspective, many of them knew that this was an intention to, to free a continent uh, from an oppressive dictatorship. And so the best way we can do the, to honor these lives is to live a life worthy of their sacrifice. And that could be a lot of different things. And then in, in the United States right now, with everything that we're going through, it can be getting involved in your school boards, in elections, in commissions, and testifying in the state legislatures. And you pick a passion like that and get involved in things. Serve this nation in the way that you know how and, and what is your passion. That recognizes their sacrifice. And hopefully we can also not repeat the lessons of warfare and we can settle things without having to do this. Expanding on that, Walter Stitt, who fought in tanks that day and turns 100 next month, tells AP, quote, there are things worth fighting for, adding that we'll learn one of these days, but I won't be around for that. Expanding on what you talked about earlier, how do we ensure the sacrifices made that day weren't made in vain? Yeah, that is a difficult one because it's the nature of humankind, unfortunately, to want to resolve their their uh, their conflicts through actual warfare rather than other means. And so one of the things we need to do as Americans is continue to be that example for everybody around the world of what it means to settle things diplomatically to, to, to the extent possible and do the things that are necessary to prevent wars in the first place if if we can, there's no perfect answer to stop all wars, but much of what is going on today was preventable. And unfortunately, it, it has gone the route that it has. So I think I think the best thing we can really do for these veterans and the lessons of, of everything of World War II and so many wars since is to do what it takes to prevent these in the first place and settle our differences another way. On that note, President Biden and other world leaders mark today's anniversary in Normandy. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky was also there. Many know that his presence brings the past of World War II and current tensions together. What are the lessons we can draw from history as we are once again living in what many consider to be dangerous times? Well, you know, going back to the idea that we can actually prevent many of these wars by making smart decisions by using other means such as you know diplomacy and economics and various and, and things like that Th there were ways to prevent these conflicts that are happening today it's not a hundred percent guarantee but you know being as involved as i am in international relations and watching the affairs of state and inside of our own government there are things we could have done that could have stopped this or at least giving it the given it the best chance to have been stopped in the first place and and unfortunately of course this speech that uh, was given at Normandy was really a missed opportunity to focus really on the veterans, the sacrifices they made, you know, the difficulty of this mission and everything that this mission entailed when it came to really Normandy being the start point of the liberation of a continent as they moved their way from there all the way to Berlin. So 
that is, it, unfortunately, it was it just kind of turned into a, a campaign speech that focused on the wrong things. There's no reason to link the message of Ukraine and Russia to the history of World War II. There's two distinct events, and that's not what today is supposed to be about. Today is supposed to be about those who are still alive on the 80th anniversary of this day. And Darren, switching gears a bit, in 2018, you actually promoted one of your lieutenants to captain on Omaha Beach over there. Tell us about that. What does this day mean to you? Well, you know, obviously, being on the Normandy beaches is one of those things that was on my bucket list. There's just one of those, this is just one of those things you have to do when you have a, a history background, you served in the military, uh, you know you just you need to get there. And I took a lot of the leadership that I had within the battalion that I was commanding all over Eastern Europe and brought them all together on the Normandy beaches and said, you cannot experience this in any other way than being present and seeing the terrain and seeing the beaches and understanding the best you can about what they went through. And I think it, it breeds a humility and it, bring, and it makes you grounded in the reality that things that are like that are difficult. Americans do hard things alongside of our Canadian, our Polish, and our British allies. And for them to see that, and for me to see that in person, was extremely humbling. And it gives greater context, and, it, and it, you can just tell that what you're looking at in the wheelchairs at Omaha Beach and Utah Beach and all the, and the different ceremonies is, her, is heroism. And we need to do all we can to make sure that we honor that. Darren Gobb, retired Army Lieutenant Colonel, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, sir. And in the nation's capital, the Friends of the World War II Memorial held a commemorative service in honor of D-Day. Our Washington correspondent, Luis Martinez, has the details. Two World War II veterans and the surviving daughter of a U.S. serviceman who died in the beaches of Normandy 80 years ago were honored this Thursday at the National Mall. I spoke with U.S. Army Major Matt Vizzer as he reflected on today's anniversary. Let's listen what he had to say. Um, today was meaningful to reflect on how much was accomplished by the greatest generation, but also to reflect on how unified we are with our allies. There's really strong alliance. Important for me to be a part of today. I've served with the 101st and the 82nd Airborne Division, as well as 18th Airborne Corps. The 101st Airborne Division is the U.S. Army unit that parachuted behind enemy lines on D-Day. Foreign delegations also placed wreath this Thursday at the National Mall in commemoration of the shared sacrifice with Allied troops. Uh, really makes you reflect about what the uh, finest generation did for future gen generations and how we got together after the Second World War to make sure that something like this would never happen again. It's really a, a, a time to, to think about where we are, uh, where we're going and uh, what the future generations left for us to, to take care of. I also spoke with Vietnam War veteran John Moreland as he reflected on what D-Day and World War II meant for his generation. Well, my dad was a World War II veteran, but just being here thinking after reading books on, you know, the D-Day invasion and what this country did, you know, it's, it's honoring to me. You get chills and any time I ever hear, you know, Star Spangled Banner or Taps, you know, it's hard to keep tears from getting in my eyes. The Friends of the World War II Memorial read the list of the approximately 1,000 known U.S. service members who died on D-Day 80 years ago. It's also worth noting that at least 12 U.S. congressmen traveled to France and at least eight U.S. congressmen who are military veterans parachuted into Normandy this Thursday. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. One of the most momentous trials in American sports history, the NFL defends itself against allegations that it's harming fans by violating antitrust law. Here's the story. NFL fans are suing the NFL in a multi-billion dollar class action. The case revolves around the price they need to pay for the NFL Sunday ticket package. The sides are fighting over whether the NFL teams are allowed to collectively sell 
uh, their broadcast rights. Sports law professor Mark Edelman says the 32 NFL teams are basically 32 separate businesses under the Sherman Antitrust Act. Separate businesses are supposed to be competing against one another uh, to provide the best product at the lowest cost uh, with the highest quality. Uh, they are not supposed to be working together. But fans allege they are. Fans have to pay a high price for the Sunday ticket package if they want to see out-of-market games on Sunday. For example, an Atlanta Falcons fan who lives in Pennsylvania would have to buy the package. What is at stake for the fans is, is that ability to pick and choose which games they will pay for to watch that are out of town. Sports attorney Katie Charleston says Sunday ticket prices are inflated because fans can't get these games anywhere else. What's at stake for the NFL is a big shakeup of their business model and up to $21 billion in damages. A win for the plaintiffs would take a big chunk of money out of the pockets of the NFL owners, uh, but it would in no way break them. The sale of a new football expansion team would immediately probably bring in a minimum of 3 to $5 billion. Edelman says many such cases usually settle before final adjudication. And in more sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin over at the Sports Hub. Dave, plenty going on today, but let's start in tennis as number one ranked Iga Sviatek top Coco Goff at the semifinals of the French Open. What are her chances of winning the final Saturday? You know, I'd say very good. Now, she's going to play 15th ranked uh, Jasmine Paulini for the title on Saturday. Now, Paulini, as I mentioned, she's ranked 15th, so she's obviously no pushover. But Sviatek has won both of their career matches, and really neither one was actually very close. Now, should Sviatek win Saturday the title, this will be her third straight, fourth in five years. Now, only uh, Chris Everett and Steffi Graf have ever won more than three. Now, in today's match, Goff at least gave her a run in the second set. This is Sviatek. Sviatek took the first set 6-2, but Goff got an early break in the second before Sviatek roared back with wins in five of the last six games. Now, on the men's side, we'll have two semifinal matches tomorrow. Yannick Sinner versus Carlos Alcaraz, and then Alexander Zverev facing Kasper Ruud. Um, all four of those guys are ranked in the top ten, so I think those will be two very competitive matches. Moving to hockey news, the Arizona Coyotes are relocating to Utah in an unusual move that had the league purchase the franchise and then resell it. Will they have a new nickname as well? Uh, they they are, will have a new nickname, but it won't be done in time for the new, new season. They're simply going to be known as Utah next year. Now, right now, they're doing a fan voting. They've got six possible nicknames. I think there's some actually intriguing picks here, Tiff. We've got the Utah Blizzard, the Utah Hockey Club, the Utah Mammoth, the Outlaws, the Venom, and my personal favorite, the Utah Yeti. So there could be some very interesting jerseys next season whenever they do decide this. Now, meanwhile, the Stanley Cup Finals start Saturday. It seems like the storyline here is going to be three-time MVP Connor McDavid. He's in his prime. He's the best player in the league. He does not have a Stanley Cup title. But meanwhile, Florida is the favorites here uh, to win this series. Shifting gears to NBA news, the Los Angeles Lakers are in the midst of a head coaching search with some high-profile names being floated as possibilities. Is LeBron James's free agency situation making this hire more urgent for L.A.? I would say for sure. I mean, he can opt out of his contract later this month, become a free agent, sign with whatever team he wants, or he can stay with the Lakers. And boy, for a guy who's about to turn 40 years old, it is amazing. He is still producing at a very high level. The Lakers definitely want him back. Now, the two possibilities that have been floated around uh, be the, to be their new head coach, one of them is J.J. Redick, a former NBA player and a current podcaster. The other is UConn men's uh, coach Dan Hurley, who's led his team to two straight national titles. Now, these are according to reports by Associated Press and ESPN, citing anonymous sources. NTD has been unable to verify them. But James has connections to both guys. He's done a podcast with J.J. Redick, and he's publicly praised Dan Hurley's coaching as he led uh, UConn to, two, to his second straight title this March. So maybe if they hire one of those two guys, plus they draft LeBron's son, Bronny, in the upcoming draft, maybe that seals a deal when LeBron comes back this year. Tonight, the NBA Finals get underway with Game 1 in Boston. Now, a lot has been made of Dallas's two stars who have been especially tough to stop at the end of games. What does Boston need to do to slow them down? 
Boy, that is a tall task, but you're right. That was definitely the theme of their win over Minnesota. The first three games in that series were really up for grabs, but it was Dallas's play at the end that won all those, those first three games. When I say Dallas's play at the end, I'm starting to, talking about their dynamic duo of Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic. Let's take a look at their season stats here. Now Doncic, he was third in the MVP in, in voting here at 30, I'm sorry, he averaged 34 points a game that led the league in scoring his assist 9.8. Uh, that was second. His rebounds were 15th. Uh, exceptional for a guard. Now, meanwhile, Irving, as well as Boss's duo here, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, all three of those guys were in the top 20 in scoring. Now, I think for this matchup here, I think the Celtics are kind of have to rely on Tatum and Brown, both forwards, to guard Doncic, who is actually a guard, just because he's a very big guard. But this is going to pose some problems for Boston. You don't want your best players in foul trouble either. Now, meanwhile, for Irving, I think they're gonna, they've got some good options for this one. You've got Derek White or Drew Holiday. Both of these are known as very good defensive players. Now, as for my pick, I have gone back and forth on this one. Ultimately, I think Boston's like more balanced team roster, plus the fact that they'll get home court advantage, I'm gonna pick them to win in seven games. Dave, as always, thanks for joining us. Thank you, too. And that's all for today's news. For round the clock coverage, visit us at NTD.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.